do please sit down. And if you have a Bible to hand or on a device, it'd be wonderful if you could turn to Psalm 10 with me. Psalm 10. As I said, we're continuing our little series through Psalms 9 to 17, and we reached Psalm 10 this morning. I'm going to pray and ask for God's help as we turn to his word. And again, Father, we confess our total dependence upon you. We know that you are the king of all, and there's no way that we could know you or receive your word or to have it change us in the way that it should, apart from the help of your spirit. So please open our minds and our hearts, speak to us, and give us ears to hear, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me read to us then from Psalm 10. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes that they've devised. For the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high, out of his sight. As for all his foes... He puffs at them. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved throughout all generations. I shall not meet adversity. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. He sits in ambush in the villages. In hiding places, he murders the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. He lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws him into his net. The helpless are crushed, sink down and fall by his might. He says in his heart, God has forgotten. He's hidden his face. He will never see it. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your head, your hand. Forget not the afflicted. Why does the wicked renounce God and say in his heart, you will not call to account? But you do see, for you know mischief and vexation, that you may take it into your hands. To you, the helpless commits himself. You have been the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. It'd be great if you might keep that open in front of you. There's also an outline of the sermon as ever on the notice sheet in the service sheet if you're following along. And they're sober words, aren't they? I don't imagine there's anyone here who hasn't had at least some occasion to ask that question in verse one. Why? Uh, One writer begins his comments on Psalm 10 like this. It's difficult to live in this world of corruption, abuse, and mindless cruelty, and not experience a recurring spiritual nausea. When one witnesses the senseless injustice in the world and the prosperity of those who are responsible for it, nausea turns to indignation and righteous rage. And I take it that we can all relate to that nausea indignation and rage at a really deep level. We know that the world is not the way that it should be. The weakest and the poorest members of our society should not be exploited and the wicked should not get away with their crimes. And yet that's what happens. And for the Christian, the problem is particularly acute because we believe in a God who's meant to be in charge of everything and who's meant to be good. And more than that, he's the the covenant Lord 
the one who has committed himself to his people through his son and promised to do good to us. And so when we see God's people in particular suffer, and God still does nothing about it, which is what was happening in Psalm 10, we're bound to ask why. Why, O Yahweh, our covenant Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? The question isn't just philosophical. Why is there suffering out there somewhere? It's not just personal. Why me? It's theological in the sense that it's a, it's a direct challenge to God himself. Why are you not doing anything? Evil and trouble are near. So how come you're so far away? We're not alone in asking the question. Uh, as he hung on the cross, the Lord Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Just before we dive into the detail, you might remember that Ben told us last week that Psalms 9 and 10 uh, fit together. Lots of people think they were originally one psalm. If there's a difference, it's that Psalm 9 celebrates the triumph of God while Psalm 10 cries out to God in the midst of a crisis. Because when you look at the world, it doesn't always feel as though God is winning. Too much of the time, it looks the opposite. I've got two points then as we look at it together. First, the arrogant injustice of the world in verses 2 to 11. The arrogant injustice of the world. Um, and Charles Spurgeon has some great books on the Psalms. His comment on uh, Psalm 10 is that it's the clearest portrayal of the true nature of the world that you will find anywhere in the Psalms. And the first thing that it reveals is the pride that underpins so much human speech and activity. You'll see it in verse 2. He says, the, in arrogance, the wicked do what they do. In verse 3, the wicked boasts of the desires of their soul. In verse 4, in the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek God. Verse 5, as for all his foes, he puffs at them arrogantly, dismissively. Uh, Jonathan Edwards said that pride is the most hidden, secret, and deceitful of all of our lusts. Another writer that it's not just the first of seven deadly sins, it's the, the essence of all sin. And in this psalm, pride leads people both to exalt themselves to the point where they think they have no need of God, and also then to dehumanize others to the point where we're willing to use them for our own advantage. And that is why God hates pride so much. Structurally, this first half of the psalm breaks in two, verses two to six, focus on the, the attitudes and they climax in, in man saying in his heart, I shall not be moved. Verses 7 to 11, it's, it's about behavior. And again, they climax, man saying in his heart, God has forgotten. We're going to look at them under the next two headings on the sheet, human injury and then divine insult. And it is chilling, isn't it, the way that human be beings are willing to treat each other. Uh, we see it all the time in society. And closer to home, we see it in families. We see it even in churches. The, the background to this psalm seems to be a, a deliberate and a, a violent campaign of injustice against the, the poorest and the most, most vulnerable members of God's people. But although the, the setting is specific and extreme, it's meant to call to mind for us all of man's inhumanity to man. Uh, we see it first in verse 2. In arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Literally, they, they set fire to them. Because, verse 3, the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. That is, he just wants what he wants, and he's shameless about it. His own desires are his God. And therefore, he's willing to walk over anyone who stands in his way, as long as he knows that they won't be able to fight back. It's a theme that's expanded in verses 7 to 10. As I read them, you'll notice all the hunting language. It's very predatory. 
And when we remember that it's describing actual events, it's really chilling and unsettling. Verse 7, his mouth, mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. He sits in ambush in the villages, in hiding places. He murders the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch out for the helpless. He lurks in ambush like a lion in the thicket. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws him into his net. The helpless are crushed, sink down, and fall by his might. There's that quotation often attributed to, to Gandhi, although no one's actually sure if he ever said it, that the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. If that's right, Sam is saying our, our world fails the test. Because here is someone who lurks in ambush and as the strong and powerful approach he lets them go peacefully by because he knows that they could defend themselves and so they're not good for his purposes but now here comes someone helpless that word is repeated a couple of times here's someone poor someone with no voice and that's who he's looking for so he seizes them and draws them into his net and crushes them. Do you see verse 7? His, his mouth is filled with deceit. Because often the, the words are fine. Big promises can be made, but the intent is to ex oppress and exploit. It's hard not to think of human trafficking. Uh, I'm reading a novel at the moment that, that tries to expose some of the, the underbelly of organized crime. Promises made to desperate people who are in need of a better life in another land. And then those promises set against the, the reality of slavery and the forced prostitution and everything else that so often results. But we'll be reminded too of all of the abuse scandals that we've seen in recent years, the film industry, sports club, we know in churches as well. And sometimes it's authority figures who should have been the most trustworthy, who have preyed upon the most vulnerable. But increasingly in the reports, isn't it, it's peer-to-peer -peer as well. It's in universities. It's in schools, pupil to pupil. Why, oh Lord, do you stand so far away? But as I say, even though the language is, is deliberately graphic, it is the full range of human inhumanity and injury that's in view. Uh, we know that because verse 7 is quoted by the Apostle Paul in Romans 3 in a passage in which he's saying, this is what we're all like. So Paul's saying there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned aside. No one does good, not even one. And then verse 7 is one of the, the verses he quotes from the Old Testament to illustrate his point. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. He says, there's no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I take it the point is that we, we won't, I hope, ever have literally lurked in ambush like a, a lion to seize the helpless. But I don't imagine any one of us could claim that we've never mistreated a fellow human being. In, in different ways, we've all fired bullets that are made of words. We've all presumed upon the kindness of others we've all looked at people through the lens of what can i get out of them instead of how can i serve them and that's because the the pride that, that's driving the behavior of the wicked in psalm 10 to such excess lies deep in the heart of each one of us and even deeper in the human heart that it stems from this dismissive attitude of god and this is where divine insult is added to human injury. In, in the Bible, it's always our vertical attitude to God that drives our horizontal treatment of others. Why are we like this? Well, verse 3, the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul. The one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked doesn't seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. And, and there's a shamelessness to it here. Um, Paul says of some people in Philippians, their God is their stomach. They glory in their shame. 
their minds are set on earthly things. And here it's like the, the world's natural sinful desires are so big and so engrossing that there's no room left for God. The, the natural heart wants what it wants. And so we renounce the Lord who might stand in our way. We think we're better off without God, so we don't seek him. We tell ourselves there is no God because it suits us. And if we renounce God and we still prosper, then we take it as confirmation of our invincibility and of God's irrelevance. So verse 5, his ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high, out of his sight. As for all his foes, he puffs at them. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved throughout all generations. I shall not meet adversity. This is the, the Western world in a nutshell, isn't it? That we rejected God, but we didn't get struck by lightning. Uh, medically, we live longer than ever before. Economically, we're richer than we're, we've ever been. And so we're, we're pretty pleased with ourselves as a society. We're convinced we're on the right track. Human progress is inevitable. And so we double down on our rejection of God. In verse 5, God's ways are so far above our ways that it's like we're completely oblivious to them. He's, he's operating on a different plane altogether. And it's true of so many, isn't it? He, we go through life pursuing our own desires, and we don't even stop to think about God. There's an ambiguity in the psalm as to whether the, the wicked person here is a full-on atheist or not. On the one hand, we're told in verse 4, he, he, all his thoughts are, there is no God. But in verse 11, it's a slightly different picture. He says in his heart, God has forget, forgotten. He's hidden his face. He'll never see it. So the, the driver isn't so much that God doesn't exist. It's just that even if he does exist, he's utterly impotent. We can live however we like because there is no accountability. God does not see, so I will never answer for my actions. And again, is that not our world? Maybe God exists, maybe he doesn't. The one thing we're sure of is that we'll never face his judgment. He's an irrelevance, so we can live how we like. Just think of the way that the world treated Jesus when he came. Here was God. God in the flesh. And they beat him and they spat upon him as he hung on the cross. They mocked him brazenly. And they had no sense that one day they'd stand before his judgment seat. So whether or not someone's an atheist isn't really the issue here. What, what's in view is a, a life of functional or, or practical atheism. And the kicker is it, it seems to work because in arrogance, the wicked crush the poor and God does nothing. And so the psalmist says, why, O Lord, do you stand so far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? But then the tone changes. And the, in verse 12, the psalmist moves from thinking about the arrogant injustice of the world to thinking about the eternal justice of the Lord, and that's where we're going to spend the remainder of our time, the eternal justice of the Lord. Verses 12 to 18 are a, a prayer, and if you've ever felt anything of verses 2 to 11, even verse 1 in your heart, then these verses are a model for us of how to respond when God seems to be hiding. I've got two lessons for us. One, look up and remember that God is judge and king. Look up. And remember that God is judge and king. Verse 12, arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand. Forget not the afflicted. Why does the wicked renounce God and say in his heart, you will not call to account? But you do see, for you note mischief and vexation, that you may take it into your hands. To you, the helpless commits himself. You've been a helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find no more. At its simplest, the prayer is, oh God, do something. You see, verse 14 answers verse 11. The world says God will never see. The faithful reminds themselves, God, you do see. And that is the difference that looking up to God makes. When we just look at the earth, 
we see the wicked renouncing God, treating people appallingly and prospering. And we give up, we can give up any hope of justice. But when we look up and we remember who God is, it's like a blindfold is removed and we're reminded of reality. God does see. He takes notes on all the mischief and vexation and evil and abuse in the world. And he takes matters. He will take matters into his own hands. Because verse 16, the Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from the land. It's easy to mistake God's patience for impotence. Our world loves to block out any thought of judgment day. Again, we're being reminded it is coming. The Apostle Paul in Acts 17, God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. Of this, he's given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So to the world, the resurrection of Jesus is proof of the, the folly of living without reference to God. And to the oppressed, it gives hope because it's proof that justice is coming. The predatory, the wicked, the greedy feel sure that they'll never meet adversity. And in this life, that often happens. But God will do justice one day. And armed with that confidence, the psalmist prays in verse 12, Arise, O Lord God, lift up your hand. In verse 15, break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find no more. The, the arm is the symbol of the, the evildoer's strength. And the, the prayer is, Lord, I remember that you're God and King. So please act, arise, be true to yourself and call to account every last bit of wickedness of every last evildoer until there is none left. Stand up for the helpless. It is then a prayer for complete and exhaustive justice. It's a good prayer. And sometimes God intervenes and answers the prayer now, and the wicked get their comeuppance. But we know that he will certainly answer it in the end for all. So we can pray confidently for justice because God does see. Uh, but I was thinking it, it's so easy, isn't it, to flag in this prayer for justice. Our first instinct is to think, well, what, is there any point? God seems to have hidden his face. I was reminded of Jesus' parable of the persistent widow. Do you remember it in the, the town that she lived in? The judge had no respect, we're told, for either man or God. But this widow kept coming up to him and saying, give me justice, give me justice, give me justice. And for a while, he ignored her. But then eventually, just because he wanted a quiet life, he gave her the justice that she demanded. And Jesus says, if that's how an unjust judge responds... Will not the perfect God of justice give justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. And Luke says, Jesus told this parable to the effect that we ought always to pray and not to lose heart. So we look up. We remember the character of our father, his kingly rule, his justice. And we're encouraged to pray. And then second, we let go. We look up and then we let go. That is, we commit ourselves to the Lord. There's that beautiful line in the middle of verse 14. To you, the helpless commits himself. You've been the helper of the fatherless. Again, O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and to the oppressed, so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. So because God is just, we pray for justice. And because he's the helper of the helpless, we commit ourselves to him. And we encourage others to do the same in utter dependence, turning to him and trusting him to strengthen our heart and remembering that he hears our prayers. Listen to John Calvin on this. He says, it is not in vain that God directs the hearts of his people to look to himself and to call on him in hope and patience. It is not in vain because 
His ears are never shut against their groaning. It's not in vain to entrust ourselves to the Lord. There's something very liberating about this, I think. I was reflecting again. I love that the psalmist doesn't expect us in these situations to be making grand vows or, or big promises to God in the midst of our helplessness. Just encourages us to commit ourselves to the Lord, to cast our cares and burdens upon him, to entrust ourselves to his protection. It, it's easy to try and find vengeance for ourselves. When Jesus was reviled, he didn't revile in return. He in, continued entrusting himself, we're told, to the one who judges justly, modeling what Psalm 10 is talking about. Well, friends, we're very nearly done. Much of the time, this is a horrible world to live in. Uh, injustice is rampant. The wicked prosper. Nausea, indignation, rage. It looks like God is hiding. It's natural if you stop and think about the world to ask yourself, why? Where are you, God? But we look up. And we remember that the Lord is judge and king. And so we're encouraged to pray for his intervention. And then we let go. We remember that he's the helper of the helpless and we commit ourselves to him. And I want to close by reminding us that entrusting ourselves to the Lord in this way is a safe thing to do. It is a safe and wise thing to do. There are all manner of afflictions in our church family, as many of you know at the moment. And lots of them are very profound. But God is our refuge and strength. He is a very present help in times of trouble. He's not just a, a force or a principle or a power. He is father and shepherd and helper to the helpless. He will never exploit or harm or restrict you. He will always work for your good. It is safe to let go and entrust ourselves to him. And what is true of Christian believers can be true for all. I'm aware there might be someone even watching this morning who spent their, their whole life renouncing God in the way that this psalm talks about. Just wanting what you want and going for it. And maybe today's the first time you've ever realized you will one day have to give an account for your life to God because he sees, he takes notes, and he will judge. I want to say it would still be safe for you to turn back to him because this is how gracious God is. Let me talk about it just in my own terms. God could have seen the ways in which over the course of my lifetime, far too many ways, if I'm honest, I've failed to treat other people in the way that I should have done. And seeing all of that failure to love my neighbor as myself, quite apart from the way that I've treated the Lord Jesus, God could have just thrown the book at me. But instead, he chose to offer me, all of us, a way out from under the judgment that we deserve. The Bible explains that as Jesus went to the cross, he was taking upon himself the very judgment that Psalm 10 promises. He was choosing to be punished for my sins and to die in my place as my substitute so that I could be forgiven for all of my wrong and free from condemnation forever. And that can be true for anyone and everyone who turns back to him. If you were to commit yourself to God today, to acknowledge him as your king, then you could know the peace and security that comes from knowing that all of the judgment that might and should fall, have fallen upon you has been directed upon to the, the Lord Jesus instead. So you can be free to know God, to love him, and renewed by him to learn to love other people as we should. Let me encourage you to talk to me about that or to a friend afterwards if you'd like to. But now let's pray as we close. Our Father, we bring to you the, um, 
the nausea, the indignation, the, the rage, the questioning that we cannot but feel as we look at a world in which there is so much injustice, so much oppression, so much predatory behavior, and that it seems to go unpunished. We have asked, why are you doing nothing, Lord? And so we thank you for reminding us that you are king forever and ever, that you do see, that you will act. Thank you for the hope of perfect justice on the day when the Lord Jesus comes again. And thank you that it's not wishful thinking. Thank you that you've proven it to us in raising the Lord Jesus from the dead so that we can know that it will happen. And we pray, therefore, that you would help us to keep our eyes fixed upon you when we're weighed down by the trials of our own life and the injustice of the world around us. And by the persecution endured by your people so explicitly in so many places in the world. Remind us that you are king forever and ever. And Father, knowing your graciousness and gentleness, that you are the father to the fatherless, the helper to the helpless, please, we pray, would we continue to look to you, to commit ourselves to you, knowing that you will strengthen our heart, knowing that you will incline your ear to us, that it's not in vain to commit ourselves to you because your ears are never blocked to our prayer. So help us please, our Father, to do that. In Jesus' precious name, amen.